Welcome to the Maranatha Television Broadcast, brought to you by Maranatha Assembly of God Church in Decatur, Illinois, and hosted by Pastors Doug and Rosemary Lowry. This program is to help you overcome the problems you face with biblical solutions. Some of the finest preachers and singers in America will appear as special guests. Exciting testimonies and inspirational music will encourage and bless you. Thank you for joining us for this issue of Maranatha. Thank you for joining us today for the Maranatha program. We are always thankful that you take this time and you join us to worship the Lord together. God is so good and I am thankful for the family of God. Let me draw your attention to the prayer line number at the bottom of your screen. It's 217-423-2430. And we would like for you to call during the week, Monday through Friday, uh, from nine o'clock till 4.30 in the afternoon and uh, we will pray with you if you have a prayer request the heavenly father wants us to ask him for our needs and help us okay well god bless you let's go into the service
Let's go before the Lord in prayer. God, we honor you today. First and foremost, we thank you that for you being worthy. Worthy is the lamb who was slain for our lives and our sins, our redemption. And we thank you, Father God, that for that reason you reign and that the name of Jesus is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. So, Lord God, we lift up these prayer requests before you. You said in your word, Lord God, that if we believe we can have whatsoever petition that we ask of you. So, Lord God, if there's a, a touch in the body that we need, Father God, we thank you for it being done under the power of Jesus Christ. If there's a financial need, Lord God, we thank you for it being done under the power of Jesus Christ. If there's a need in our homes, Lord God, we thank you for it being done under the power of Jesus Christ. If there's one that needs a job, we thank you for it being opened up under the power of Jesus Christ. Why? Because God, you reign forever and ever. We thank you, Father God, for you reign in our lives. You reign in, in our situations. You reign in our circumstances. You reign in this world, Lord God. And we thank you, Father God, that if you said in your word that if you be lifted up, all men and all things shall be drawn unto you. So we thank you, Father God, that as we continue to lift up your name, as we continue to lift up the bloodstained banner, that you shall come right on in in our situations. And we shall say that this is the Lord's doing. We shall stand in the maze, Father God, at your strength and at your sovereignty being exercised in our lives. And we shall not give any authority over to the enemy. We thank you, Father God, for souls being saved, lives being delivered and set free. Why? Because whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And we shall give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name. Well, turn with me, if you will, to the book of Ruth. I think we've got everything covered. We need to get covered. And in uh, the month of August, we're just kind of preaching by inspiration as the Holy Spirit is laying uh, things on our heart. And what the Lord gave me for today was uh, the book of Ruth, and we've entitled it From the Deepest from deepest Sorrow to Great Joy. From Deepest Sorrow to Great Joy. If you live long enough you will experience some sorrow in this life. Can I get an amen? Um, and um, I can predict to you that at some point in your life, uh, the sorrow that you are experiencing can be overwhelming. And the book of Ruth is written to help us at times like that. I love the book of Ruth. It's an interesting love story that's nestled in the front of the, of the Old Testament. Near the, right after the book of Judges, it, it takes place at the time of the Judges. This is after Israel has, in, has gone into the promised land. They have received uh, the promise of the Lord. They, they are in the land of promise. And then Judges were being raised up that were leading Israel during this time. And it's during uh, this time that the book of Ruth takes place. It is a, it is a very sad story. Uh, and it begins with great sorrow, deepest sorrow, but it ends with great joy. And it gives us great hope. And I believe that the Lord knows what we are going through as individuals and as a church or what we might go through. And it's so important that we understand that God is with us in our times of sorrow. Can I get an amen? And that God is always even working the deepest and darkest times of our life out for our good and for his glory, and that God has a better day ahead for each of us. Amen? And that's what the book of Ruth teaches us. So today, we're, we're going to just do a little synopsis on the book of Ruth. You could spend a lot of time preaching on this little, this little book, only four chapters, but so filled with such wonderful insight. You know, the book of Judges is kind of like the, uh, uh, you know, like a Western novel. It's, uh, you know, the shootout at the OK Corral type things. Are happening in the book of Judges. And then you come to the book of Ruth, which I believe is one of the most beautiful love stories that you'll read anywhere. And it's a beautiful picture of Christ's love for the church. Boaz is the Old Testament type of Christ for us, and Ruth is the Old Testament type of the church. And uh, how much Boaz loves and cares for Ruth 
is should encourage us today how much our heavenly Boaz loves and cares for us. It says in Ruth chapter 1 and verse 1, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, which means my God is king. The name of his wife was Naomi, which means pleasant one. The names of his two sons are Malon and Chilon. Malon means uh, sickly one, Chilon means pining away. They were Epaphrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to the journey of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech and Naomi's husband died, and she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab, and the name of the one son was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth, and they dwelt there about ten years. But both Malon and Chilion also died, so the woman, women survived her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughter-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people, giving them bread. Therefore she went out from the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege that we have to come together in your name once again. Thank you for the wonderful time of worship in your presence we've enjoyed. And Father, we just pray that right now that the Holy Spirit would minister his word to every heart. Lord, our soul is hungry. Our soul needs to be fed. We need fresh bread from heaven today. And I would ask, Lord, that you would fill every one of us. May we not leave this place the same way we came in, but, Lord, may the Holy Spirit help us as we share the word and communicate it. And, Father, may it be engrafted in us today, we ask in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Just a little background. You know the story. Uh, a famine had come to Israel, and Elimelech decided that he would go to the land of Moab and uh, try to do better there in a foreign land. Now, first of all, it was not a good choice because Moab... Uh, is a picture of compromise in Scripture. Uh, the tribe of Moab comes from Lot. If you remember when Sodom and Gomorrah was being judged and uh, Lot and his family were being escorted out of, of Sodom before the fiery judgment of God came upon Sodom, uh, which is a type of the rapture, uh, the godly were not left in the city when God's judgment fell, but they were escorted out by angels, and the judgment couldn't come until the church was out of the way. Can I get an amen on that? And we do remember that uh, the horrible example of Lot's wife, who looked back because her heart was still in Sodom and Gomorrah, and she was turned to stone, and that was, you know, that is a warning to us to make sure that we don't let our heart get converted to this world, but we keep our heart pure for Jesus Christ, right? And we keep looking in the right direction. And um, But you know the story that uh, the two daughters of Lot felt that the world had been annihilated. This was the end of the world. There were no other men. There was no other legacy. There was no other future. And so they got their father, Lot, drunk, and while he was drunk, they went into him, and there was an incestuous relationship and uh, through that, they were both impregnated, and they had children, and those children became the beginning of the nation of Moab. And Moab, in Scripture, it was always a thorn in the side of Israel, always an enemy to Israel, and they, they uh, represent, in Scripture, compromise, and a fleshly way of thinking, and a fleshly way of living. How many of you know the Bible says there's a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is the way of death, right? That is the mindset of Moab. It's a sign of compromise. I believe that compromise probably is one of the greatest tools the enemy has used to destroy the souls of mankind. I'll just back off a little bit. I don't have to pray too much. I can do this. I can do the other. And we begin to compromise. And when you go down that path, it will always take you to a place that is much further than you ever wanted to go. And that's what happened. Elimelech took his family. Now, were they supposed to go to another nation when there was a famine in Israel? Is that what God told them in the book of Deuteronomy? Were they supposed to leave Israel when there were hard times? 
No, what were they supposed to do? They were to pray. They were turn, to turn back to the Lord. In fact, God said that he would bless them and bless their herds and bless their fields and bless their harvest. But if they forgot the Lord, he would chasten them as a father chastens a son, and the heavens would withhold rain, there would be famine, until they turned back to the Lord. Now, can I just make the point here? There are some people I run into. We had, we're having a garage sale for CPI this week at our, our place, and I, I ran into a lady that used to attend our church, and I hope she's here today. I don't know. And I, I invited her back to church. I said, well, uh, she, I said, where do you go to church? Oh, Maranatha is my church. And I said, she said, but I just don't go hardly anymore. I, it's probably been several years since I've been to church. And I said, well, we sure want to have you come back. And she said, well, we just kind of got out of the habit, and we just kind of went this way and that way, and, and, and nothing really big. She said, we're just, not, we're, we're just not going to church. And I think there are a lot of people that have gone to Moab who didn't intend to. You know what I'm saying? They just kind of, we just neglect the house of God. We neglect prayer. We neglect the, this, the things that God has called us to do. And, uh, but somehow people get in the wrong place, but I want you to know you have the power of choice. Now, can you imagine a, sad, a sadder scenario than what we read here in the book of Ruth? Naomi, her, whose name means pleasant, her husband dies. Ten years later, both of her sons die. Her only hope for subsistence was her sons taking care of her, and now they're both gone. And can you imagine the stinging sorrow? I mean, to lose a husband is enough of a pain, right? But to lose both of your grown sons and to bury them and to know that your future is buried with them, your dreams are dashed, and you can't hardly imagine the pain that Naomi was feeling. And now she is left alone, the head of her house. She has to make a decision. She overhears that God has blessed somebody, prayed the blessing back down on Israel, Somebody played, prayed the blessing back down on the church. Anybody here today? Somebody stayed by the stuff even though the church went through some lean times. There were some difficult times. Somebody said, we're not getting up and leaving. We're going to wait and upon God until God brings blessing from heaven. And the Bible says blessing came upon Israel. They heard about it. Hey, listen, church. I'm just waiting for the world to hear about the blessing that's on the church and they're going to come running in because they live in a dry, parched land and they're looking for answers and the answer is still Jesus. Amen? And we need to pray the blessing down upon the church. Can I get an amen? That's why this prayer vigil is so important. Don't just give it lip service, but I'm telling you what, we need some intercessors and people who will say, God, we're tired of the spiritual famine that's in the land. We're tired of the spiritual dearth that's taking place in our city and in our families. And God, would you one more time before Jesus comes, visit your people with your power, your blessing, your goodness, your kindness, and pour your grace out upon us one more time. Amen? We need your help in doing that. Thank God for the people who did that back in Naomi's day. And she heard that the Lord was moving. God had visited his people. That, that kind of good news gets out, right? And notice what it says here. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had blessed his people in Judah by giving them good crops again, Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, they got ready to leave Moab and return to the homeland with her daughters-in-law. And she set out from the place where they had been living, and they took the road that would lead them back to Judah. Look at your neighbor and say, get on the right road. Get on the right road. Get on the road that will lead you back to Judah. What is Judah? Judah is a place of praise. Judah is a place of worship. Judah is the tribe that is the tribe that Jesus came from, came from. Judah is the namesake of Israel. That's why uh, people from Israel are called Jews. It comes from Judah, a people of praise, a people of worship a people who have been set apart by God to bring praise and honor to him. And they set on that road that would bring them back to Judah. There are a lot of people that are off track today that need to get back on the right road. Amen? There are a lot of people that need to make their d d decision. The power of choice is an amazing tool that God has given every one of us. And you can choose today. If you've gotten off on the wrong track, on the wrong road, you can get back on the right road today. 
You can make a decision, you know what, I'm going to get back to God, I'm going to get back to prayer, I'm going to get back to church, I'm going to get back to Bible study, I'm going to get back to thanking God and being grateful for what I have, I'm going to get back to the house of God and the people of God, and I'm going to serve God, I'm going to be sold out. You can get on that road today if you make up your mind, right? You've got the power of that kind of decision. They took the road back to Bethlehem. Bethlehem, the house of bread. Let me tell you where it's at, folks. It's in the house of the Lord. There's fresh bread in the house of the Lord. Amen. There's always a feast in the Father's house. There's always more than enough to go around in the Father's house. And she says, I'm going to go back to where I know the blessing of the Lord is in my life. Get away from the fleshly thinking. Get away from the compromise of this world. Quit making decisions based upon your emotions and how you feel and your circumstances and get a hold of the Word of God and say, you know what, I'm going to make my decisions based upon the Word of God. Oprah, or Orpah rather, and Ruth, she must be thinking about me. <laughs> I'm sure she's not. Or Orpah and Ruth also had a decision to make. Right? She said, I'm headed back. There's no future for me here, and, and I, don't, I can't have any more sons. And the one daughter-in-law, Ruth, says, I will not leave you. Wherever you go, I will go. Your God will be my God. Where you live is where I'll live. Where you die is where I'll die. And what a tremendous uh, picture of commitment that is to, to God for each of us. There comes a point in your life, at some point, you're going to have to make up your mind who you're going to serve who you're going to live, who you're going to be de dedicated to. And even though Ruth was from Moab and she was a foreigner and she served other gods, she saw something in Naomi's life that, that let her know that she wanted what Naomi had. And she says, I'm going to serve your God. I see something in you, even in your dark trials when you lost your husband. Now you've lost your sons. There's still a hope in you that resonates. There's something about your life. There's something about the God you serve. I want that and I'm going to follow you. I won't leave you. Wherever you go, I'm going to go. Wherever you, wherever you sleep, that's where I'm going to sleep. Wherever you lodge, whatever you do, that's what I'm going to do. I want to ask you a question. Do people see enough of, of Jesus in us that that's the reaction they have around us, that I want to be like you? I see the hope you have. I see the joy you have. Even in your difficult times, let me tell you something. Life is not a beach. Life is a beachhead. Life is a challenge. There's a problem. Things happen. Babies are born with problems. There's sicknesses. There's, there's diseases. There's early death. There's things that happen all around us. But in the middle of all that, we can still have hope because we know this life is not all in all. We know there's a better day coming for every child of God. Amen? And we can just get back to that place of praise, get back to that place of security that there is in Jesus Christ. And Ruth made a choice. Her choice is a, is a classic example of what it means to be a Christ follower. Now listen, we're all going to have times of difficulty, times of challenge, times of sorrow, heartbreak, disappointments. And during that time, you'll have to make a decision. And that decision will either be, I'm going to turn from God or I'm going to turn to God. I'm going to run from God or I'm going to run to the Lord. And my prayer is today that you'll run to God. Don't let the enemy make you run away from God. You know, I know it, we're all human beings. We all have those emotions. Naomi experienced them. When she did come back to Bethlehem, her friend said, Is this Naomi? And she says, Don't call me Naomi, which means pleasant one, but call me now Mara, which means bitter one, because the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. I've had nothing but sorrow for the last 10 years. And so we've all done that, haven't we? We've all said, Lord, why me? Why, why am I the one that lost my job? Why didn't I get the promotion? Why, Lord, do I have this sickness? Why was it that if you're so loving and so kind and you're so powerful, why did my loved one die? Why did that accident happen? Why did this take place? We question God, don't we, if we're honest? We're a lot like Naomi. That's what I love about the Bible. The Bible is so real. We're, that, that can happen. And yet, in the middle of all of that, she still made the right choice. There's no other place I can go, but I'm going back home. I'm going back to Bethlehem. I'm going back to that house of bread. I'm going back to Judah, the place of praise. You remember the old spiritual song we used to sing in church? Where could I go? Where could I go? Needing a refuge for my soul. Where could I go? needing a friend to guide me to the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? Let me tell you, folks, 
There's no other place you can go in your time of deepest sorrow except to the Lord. He's the only one that can help us in moments like that. Now, not only that, but if we're going to go from our deepest sorrow to great joy, God has given us another power, not only the power of choice, but the power of initiative. In the very next chapter, in chapter 2, the Bible says that one day Ruth the Moabite came to Naomi and said, let me go out into the harvest fields to pick up the stalks of grain left behind by anyone who is kind enough to let me do it. And Naomi replied, all right, my daughter, go ahead. Now, listen, a Moabite was a foreigner. They weren't looked upon the same way as, as the Jews looked upon the Jews. And um, Ruth was a, was a very attractive young lady. Um, her name, Ruth, means companion or friend and also means beautiful one. I mean, she was a, she was a Mediterranean beauty. Olive skin, beautiful. When Malon had married her, he fell in love with her probably at first sight. She was a beautiful gal. And uh, she was out doing the only thing that she could do. She humbled herself. She, she did the job of a, of a servant as she was out gleaning the fields. She could have said, you know, I, I, this is beneath me. Uh, I'm not doing this. I might break a nail. Uh, I, I, I really can't let people see me all dirty and sweaty and see what, how, how low down my life really is that I'm reduced to this that if I don't go out and try to pick up what others have left behind, I'm going to starve. This is as low as I can be. Has anybody been there? You know what I'm talking about? She was as low as you could possibly be, and yet she was not too proud to use what gift she had. The gift she did have was she was young, and she was strong, and she could bend over, and she could get the harvest, and so it was the only way that Naomi and her were going to survive. Naomi was older, couldn't go into the field all day long, and so she did the only thing that she could do. She took initiative. Everybody say initiative. She did something. She did what she could do. Some people are waiting around for God to do it all. And let me tell you something. I know somebody says it's not in the Bible. God helps those who help themselves. But it is in the book of James that faith and works go together. But if you'll have some initiative and begin to use the talent and gift that you have, God can bless that and he can make something greater out of it than you ever thought. But you've got to get off your blessed assurance and get up and take some initiative. Hallelujah. I didn't say anything wrong there at all. All right. Leviticus had made a provision that when Israel came into the promised land and God had blessed their crops, that they were to leave some of the crops for the needy and for the homeless and for those who were without and for the foreigner. In fact, God had told them, when you harvest your fields, do not harvest it all the way into the corners, but leave the corners for the traveler and the foreigner and the homeless one. And when you're, when you're gathering up your crop, if you accidentally drop any of your crop, you cannot pick it up and put it back in the bundle. You are to leave that behind for the person who is down on their luck and they need some help. And God says, and the reason I'm doing this is because you also were foreigners and sojourners in Egypt and people took you in. Let me tell you something, church. Before we get too high and mighty and we've been blessed and God has blessed us, let's not forget where God has brought us from. Let's not forget the time that he brought us when we had nothing and we had no hope and no future and God made a way for us where there was no way. Amen? And so let's leave something behind. Let's not, let's not use it all up for ourselves. When you get a promotion, instead of having, having a, you know, a way of, of t having a better way to live, maybe it's all about having a better way to give. Amen? Leaving something behind for those who need a little bit more. How many of you know I'm telling you the truth, right? And because of that provision, I love that about our God. He's always caring about the needy and the person that, that is uh, in, a, in a place of jeopardy and leave that behind for that person. And she went out, and that's all she can do. See, I don't know what your gift is, but I, but I do know this, that if the only job you can find is flipping hamburgers, if you'll do it as unto the Lord, there may come a day when you own that place and other people will be flipping hamburgers for you. If you'll keep your attitude right and work as unto the Lord and do whatever God gives you to do. In, in this situation, it was gleaning the fields. That's the worst thing you could think of doing. But it sure was better than sitting around and starving to death. And she did what she could do. And usually a big break is the result of doing smaller things well first. A big break comes to those who work 
and do the smaller things first. Is there something you need to take initiative in today? God will bless the work of our hands, the Bible says. God says, I will bless the work of your hands, but you didn't notice the condition there? Your hands have got to be working. I will bless the work of your hands. Find something that God can bless and then do it with all your heart. Do it unto him. If you're a student, uh, go for the best grades that you can make. Believe God to bless you academically. Believe that God's going to help you. Do it all to the glory of God, but take the initiative and do something with your life because God can do something much more through your life than you ever would have imagined. Amen? The power of God's favor. That's the next thing. If you want to go from greater sorrow to great joy, let's not forget the power of God's favor, God's blessing. I'm going to make this statement. I've said it before, and I mean it with all my heart. I'm not kidding. I'd rather have the blessing of God than a million dollars. I'd rather have the favor of God upon my life than all the money that you can you can amount that you could mount up, because God's blessing and and favor uh, permeates every area of your life, physically, spiritually, emotionally, financially, every area. The the blessing of the Lord is an amazing thing, and the favor of God was upon Ruth because of her choice to follow Naomi and to follow her example and to follow Jehovah to follow God, and all of a sudden. There is this meeting of Boaz and Ruth. But in my mind, he's driving up in a Lincoln Town Car, okay? And he's got an Armani suit on, you know? Well, if, maybe he's in a field. Okay, Armani cover, coveralls, all right? And he rolls down the window, and he looks out, and he sees this beautiful young lady. I mean, she's got beautiful skin. She's got numbers. If you don't know what that is, ask one of the young guys. They'll tell you what that means. Okay? I'm not going to give you the dimensions because I'll get in trouble. All right? And he says, he says to his foreman, he says, Ralph, I'm not making this up. It's not in the Bible. Ralph, who is that babe out there in my field? He said, well, that's Ruth. She's a Moabite. That's Naomi's daughter-in-law. She came up here after her husband died. She's a widow. And he says, wowza, wowza. Tell her that she can have lunch with me today. He sits down and has lunch with her. It's love at first sight. I mean, he's smitten. She's beautiful. And the, and the foreman says, yeah, she's been out early this morning, been working all day, took one little break, just one little break in the shelter, drank a little water, but she's been out there working, and she's, she's taking care of herself and taking care of her mother-in-law, making sure that they have enough to subsist on it, enough, enough to live. And I'm telling you what, God's favor came upon Ruth when she met her Boaz. And the biblical advice is, that if you're a Ruth here today and you're waiting patiently for your Boaz, you may have seen this. While you're waiting on your Boaz, don't settle for any of his relatives. Don't go for Brokaz, Poaz, Lionaz, Cheatinaz, Dumbaz, Drunkaz, Locked Up As. <laughs> Good for nothing as, or lazy as. But wait on your Boaz. Go on. I see, I see you've all been around that family. And that was spelled A-Z, by the way, A-Z. How many believe there's a provision for all of us in life? How many believe we serve a God of abundance? That God knows your need and God knows the, the, the actual component that needs to come into your life at any, any given time? That he knows what his fulfillment is for your life and my life and what we need to do is hold steady? And I tell you what, young ladies or young men, if you're waiting for that mate in life, it's better to have no one until you get the one that God has chosen for you. You're better to make Jesus your all in all till the right man, right woman comes along and God knows how to get them to you just in time. Amen? 
Boaz means a, might, a man of might and strength. It actually says of fierce strength. Boaz, a man of fierce strength, a man of might. He's a type of Jesus, a type of Christ here. And Ruth is a type of the church. That we have needs, but there is a heavenly Boaz that has favor for us that loves us at first sight. He loves his church. Oh, we're a mess. We might have problems, but I'll tell you what, Jesus is in love with his church. He loves you and he loves me. And he says to his foreman, he says, I want you to watch out for her. I want you to protect her, make sure that nobody harms her. I want you to leave handfuls of grain to fall on the ground on purpose. I want you to bless her. I want you to leave uh, little piles of provision for her everywhere you go, and I don't want you to give her a hard time because I want to bless her, and I want to tell you today that if Boaz in the Old Testament was doing that for, for Ruth, God is doing that for his church today. He knows what your need is, and if you'll continue to follow him and do what you can do, he's going to put blessing in your path. Amen? On purpose, God's going to put blessing in your path. That's the kind of God we serve. Amen? Right now, Jesus is commanding his servants, his angels, to put blessings in the path of every child of God to make provision for you. It wasn't a coincidence. It wasn't something that just happened. God is putting a blessing in your path. He's going to make a way for you. And if you'll just continue to do what you can do, God will do what you can't do. Amen? God won't do what you can do, but God will do what you can't do. Are you hear what I'm saying? God won't do what you ought to be doing, but he will do what you can't do, and blessings will be in your way. She was still gleaning in the field. She was still working hard. She was still doing that part, but it was different now because the blessing of the Lord had come upon her life. I've got a good word for you today that God's blessing is all you need to get through this life. God can make things happen when nobody else can make them happen in your life. Hallelujah. I tell you what, this is good preaching. I'm preaching better than you're helping me, but this is good preaching. And the truth is, I have to eat my own cooking, so I think this is pretty good. You women are like that, aren't you? When you, when you, fi when you fix something pretty good, you say, oh, that's pretty good. I think I'll have another helping. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, the power of redemption. The power of redemption. I love the word redemption. How do I get from great sorrow to great joy? There's a redeemer in the house. We sang about him today. Redeemer, Savior, Healer. Jesus is our redeemer. I love that word redeem. That word redeem, people say it means to buy back. Well, that's true. A price is paid. That person, the debt is paid. The debt is canceled. That has been redeemed. Or you go to redeem a coupon. The coupon has worth to it. Here's the coupon. Now I get the, the item that it, it redeems or it buys for me. And that certainly is the meaning of that word. But redemption also means restoration. It means to bring to as good a place or better place than you were in the beginning. It means to make a new beginning, a new start, that your life is redeemed. Your life starts over. There is a new history that is going to be made now, a new legacy that will be left behind. And I love that about God. I am so thankful that God can redeem our life, even if we have made horrible mistakes, even if our past is a checkered past, even if we are, uh, if we are embarrassed about some decisions we made in the past. Aren't you glad that when we come to our Redeemer, He can redeem our future? Hallelujah. And He can give us a brand new start every time we come to Him. So now Boaz is smitten. He is in love with this beautiful Mediterranean beauty called Ruth. She's a hard worker. He loves that about her. Listen, a little advice. If you're picking out a wife, always find a wife who has thick eyebrows. Because what has happened, the adaptation that has happened over the centuries is women who come from a line of hard workers always have very heavy eyebrows because the eyebrows keep the sweat from rolling down into your eyes from working hard so if you have a woman that has heavy eyebrows she's a hard worker that's right so if you're plucking your eyebrows you might want to think about that okay that's just a little pastor Doug tip here so for, to all the guys they're looking okay Come on, Sister Brittany, I saw those eyebrow thickeners you had on, on Facebook. I saw that. All right. But you already got your man, so you don't, 
Rosemary's blowing a whistle at me. All right, I got it. What's that got to do with redemption? Not much. Here we go. God redeem this message, please. Okay. He's smitten. He loves her. He doesn't know how to make the love connection. We guys, we're so faltering and stumbling, and we don't know what to say. We don't know how to make it happen, right? And uh, so anyhow, that's the first time you said amen all day right there, Rosemary. <laughs> but thank God for Naomi. Thank God for women in the church. They know how to get things done. Oh, is that it? Come on. I, I mean, I come on. I... I lobbed that one across the net to you, right? You should have you slammed that one back. So Naomi says, look, Boaz is your kinsman redeemer. And by the law, here again, God made a provision that if, if a husband died, what happened is the nearest of kin, a, 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 a brother, if there was a brother, would take that wife, a widow, and would uh, raise up a family to the name of the, the husband had died, so that that uh, wife and family wouldn't be left out. They would still have part of the inheritance, would have land, would have provision. I love that about God. God doesn't let anybody fall between the cracks. Isn't that wonderful? He takes note of every person. And so that was a provision in the Scripture. It says he's one of your, uh, one of your kinsmen redeemers. He's, he's related to us, so this could, this could be the, the guy. And so here's what you do. Here's what you do. And this is good advice to all you ladies who are going on a date, okay? It says Bathe. Okay? He says, bathe. You know, that I heard that in uh, the reason that weddings were in June that started in Europe is because they took their yearly bath in June. That's, when they, that's why they had all the weddings in June. I don't know if that's true. Somebody could Google and see if that's true. <clears throat> but bathe, put on the most expensive and best-smelling perfume and oil that you've got. Put on your best dress. Go to Miss Brittany and get your hair put up just right. Or someone like that, right? Put all the put all the stuff in your hair. Put on your best outfit. Go down there looking and smelling like a million bucks. And go to the threshing floor. And at night when Boaz lays down to sleep, you slip in and lay at his feet because that was the Jewish custom of the woman saying to the kinsman redeemer will you put me under your covering will you give me a home will you redeem me and she asked now he awoke he was dreaming about her anyhow he was thinking wowza wowza Ruth the Moabite She's a knockout. She's a babe. But I'm, I'm older. She's going to want some younger guy. She's probably not going to want me. And then he wakes and he smells that waft of jungle gardenia or Janelle number five. White shoulders. Red door. I don't know. Poison. <laughs> I, I, I don't know which fragrance it was. See, this is why I love to read the Bible. I don't know how you read yours, but anyhow. <laughs> and he's startled, and he wakes up, and he says, what are you doing here? And she says, will you cover me? Will you accept me? And he takes part of his blanket and throws it over her which is a sign I've accepted you into my household you're under my covering now and husbands just always remember we're our wife's covering we're there to protect them to love them to nurture them to help them to support them all through life amen ladies that was another good place for you to say amen I'm trying to help you here okay right and then Boaz says to her you 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 need, need to get up and leave. I'll do this. I will redeem you. There's one who's closer than I am. I'm going to redeem you. But And he gave her. she gave her a, a bushel full of wheat, of barley to take. I mean, this woman was strong. She took a bushel full. She had heavy eyebrows. Remember all that? She, she took, the, took the bushel of, of barley and took off. 
and went to tell Naomi what had happened. Naomi says, all you got to do is just wait right here, darling. Said the love bug has bit. He won't rest today until he has settled this thing. He's going to redeem you. You just sit here and wait. Boaz is at work. He's going to make it happen. What a beautiful picture of salvation. You can't save yourself. You can't make yourself righteous. All we do is we ask Jesus, can I come into your household? Can I be safe? Can I be a part of your family? All we do is ask, and he says, you stay right here, and I'm going to go fix it. I'll go pay the price. And he went all the way to Calvary, paid the price for you and me. And it's through that bloodline that we have been adopted into the family of God. Hallelujah. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to make it happen. Your heavenly Boaz is out negotiating the deal. Amen. He paid the deal. So Boaz goes and sees this other guy that's a little older, that is a little closer, and he says, you don't really want to, you don't really want to marry Ruth, do you? You don't really want to buy this land, do you? And the guy says, well, now come to think about it, I really don't want to, to buy it. He said, it would mess up my inheritance anyhow. He says, why don't you just go ahead and do that? And Boaz says, I'm buying the land, and with the land I get the widow. I get Ruth. He paid the price. I want you to know you and I are paid with a price. We are to glorify God with our, in our body and our spirit as long as we're alive because there is a great price that was paid for us. Christ did the work of redemption. Nothing we could do but ask. And it says here, And with the land I've acquired Ruth, the Moabite widow of Malon, to be my wife. And this way she can have a son to carry on the family name of her dead husband and to inherit the family property here in his hometown. And you are all witnesses of this this day. And then it goes ahead to say, So Boaz took Ruth into his home, and she became his wife. And when he slept with her, the Lord enabled her to become pregnant, and she gave birth to a son. From death and sorrow to life and legacy and great joy. The story ends as sad as any story I've ever heard in life, but it ends with such great joy. And I want you to know, God is not done writing the final chapter in your life. Somebody needs to hear that. God is not done writing the final chapter in your life. There is still, but Naomi thought it was over. Don't call me pleasant. Call me bitter. Life has been bitter to me. But Naomi was holding a brand new little baby grandson now, and his name was Obed, which means the servant of the Lord. I want you to know that out of your sorrow may come one of the greatest things you've ever birthed. Out of your deepest, darkest valley, God may give birth to a brand new legacy in your family and in your life. God may do more through the difficult times than he did through the good times in your life. Ruth has a son by Boaz. They name him Obed, servant. He becomes the father of Jesse, who was a king, was King David's father. Isn't that amazing? So this Moabite gal, this foreigner, is adopted in. But I need to tell you some of the rest of the story. Ruth becomes the, grand, the great-grandmother of King David. But Boaz, who is Boaz? Boaz is the son of Rahab, the harlot. Rahab, who let the, golden cord, or let the scarlet cord down so that they would see when they came into Jericho that she was the one that had given uh, the, the spies uh, safe passage and, and had given the, them the information. And she was adopted into, by faith, was adopted into uh, Israel and became a convert to Judaism by faith. And, and we need to understand that in the body of Jesus Christ, in the bloodline of Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter whether you're a Gentile or what race you came from, Rahab and Ruth are both in the genealogy of the Messiah because God is telling us it doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter how bad you've been messed up. I don't care what nationality you come from. God's people have always been people who have come through the blood by faith. Hallelujah. I don't care what color you are, what nationality you are. There's only one thing that's going to matter is the blood of Jesus Christ on that day. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. God can turn your deepest sorrow into great joy. God can turn it around. Hang on. It's not over till it's over, right? It's not over till it's over. I want you to stand with me if you would. Rain. Because if the book of Ruth teaches us anything, it teaches us that, that God reigns. He reigns over our circumstances. He reigns over our life. He reigns over even our difficulties, our hard times, our sorrows, our disappointments in life. 
and that God has a new day for every child of God. God has a new day for every child of God. Sometimes what we think is the worst thing that happens to us is the best thing. That's Romans 8.20. I can prove it to you. God redeems every situation. God redeems every life. Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers that rejected him, hated him, wanted to murder him. It hadn't been for one of the older brothers that said, no, let's not kill him. Let's, if we're going to get rid of him, let's just sell him as a slave and we'll get the money, which is all a picture of Christ being sold for, you know, as slavery and all this stuff. And, he, and, and Joseph gets into more trouble by doing the more right things than anybody ever known. Keeps doing the right things and getting into deeper and deeper trouble. Finally, he becomes the prime minister of Egypt, second only to the Pharaoh. His brothers stand before him. They're fearing for their lives. They were mean to him. They hated him. They wanted him dead. And now he has their life in the palm of his hands. And they know it. And they're shuddering in their boots. Let me tell you how you know if you've forgiven somebody. You, you know, not, only, not only are you committed to trying to reconcile to them, but you'll help them survive. He was providing for them in times of famine. He had forgiven them so much that not only did he, he, he forgive them, but he was giving them grain so they could live. But at the end of all that, Genesis 50, 20, they were so afraid that he was going to kill them, especially then after his father, when Jacob died. They said, now that Jacob is gone, he's going to kill us again. And at the very end of your Bible, in Gen or end of the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, to settle their fears, Joseph says to them, you meant this for evil. You meant it for evil. But God turned it for good. It's another way of Roman, saying Romans 8, 28, for I know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. I may not see it now. I may not know how this bad thing that's happened, how this sorrow is going to work out anything that is good, but somehow I'm going to trust him. I'm going to keep on doing what I'm going to glean in the fields. I'm going to do what I can do. I'm going to keep that job that God has given me until I get a better job. I'm going to keep pounding away until God shows favor in some other area. But I know that somehow He is going to turn my situation around. Amen? That He's a God like Bo that is pictured here in Boaz that is in love with His church, that wants to give good things unto His church, and He reigns over your life. I want to again for joining us for the Maranatha program. I trust you receive something from God's Word that you listen to, but not just listen, will apply it to your life. That's what I need to do, so I'm not going to ask you to do something that I'm not willing to do first, okay? Well, God bless you. Till we see you again next week, Maranatha. We want to thank you for joining us today for Maranatha. Remember, a warm welcome always awaits you at Maranatha Assembly of God in Decatur. If we can help in any way, please don't hesitate to call or write. Until next week, here is wishing you God's best on behalf of the Maranatha family.